Thanks a bunch. Yeah, it's the third day. I know everybody's listened to like a million talks, so you probably won't remember a thing that I say, but at least I'll try to make this kind of entertaining. So my talk today is about distributed scheduler hell, and you might think, oh, that's kind of a strange topic name, but really it's a story of how we moved hundreds and hundreds of virtual machines onto containers on top of both Mesos and Kubernetes. And before I get started, I'm just curious, who here in the audience already knows what a distributed scheduler is? So I, I see about a third of the hands, which is good. So because the first portion of this talk is kind of the kind of an intro to what a distributed scheduler is. So I'm going to kind of do this as a story. So we had a lot of pain and suffering. So I work at DigitalOcean, and we have lots and lots of internal microservices and applications. And they were all running on virtual machines because that was really the only primitive we had internally at the company. And it was just getting unmanageable to have hundreds of virtual machines for each application. So we started to look at moving things onto like Mesos and Kubernetes. So just, I want, if you just take away a couple things from this presentation by the end is, I want you to know what a distributed scheduler is. What are the valid use cases? And there's a whole bunch of things that you should not use distributed schedulers for, and you probably will try. And hopefully I'll try to convince you not to use them for certain things. Fine. All right, let's get started. So what is a distributed scheduler? So almost every single person in this room is probably already have used a distributed scheduler. If you're using a cloud hosting company like DigitalOcean, Amazon, or Google, you're using a distributed <coughs> scheduler. Now, a lot of developers or even DevOps people, when they think of distributed schedulers, they think of things like Kubernetes, they think of Docker, they think of containers. But things like VMware or your cloud are also distributed schedulers. They're just scheduling virtual machines. When you go and you use the cloud, you think, oh, I'm just getting a virtual machine and it's all magical and good. But that virtual machine has to end up on some server in the cloud, right? And to do that, they have distributed schedulers that decide where your virtual machine is going to land, right? And now, most companies nowadays are slowly but surely moving away from virtual machines and moving on to containers. So like, most of my talk today is going to more be focused on distributed schedulers for containers. Um, before I get started, anybody here use an Arduino, like to play with Arduinos? There's like 10, 15 people, which is a lot of fun. So Arduino is like these little hacking computers. And the reason I like to bring this up is because an Arduino can only run one process. It can't multitask, it can't do more than one thing at once. It just does one thing. And you're like, how could I possibly have a machine that does anything that doesn't have threading and locks and all this? But it's actually, you can do a lot with a single process. When you think about a microservice, a microservice is just a single process, right? And we have to run it with a bunch of other processes. So if we want to scale up a little bit more, right, we talk about a multi-process system. We talk about Linux, right? So like when your cloud hoster, your hypervisors run Linux, and Linux gives you multiple processes and, and through a scheduler. But what, is, what does that actually mean? Like, what is a scheduler actually providing in Linux, right? So it's giving you things like virtual memory. It's giving you process isolation, uh, disk storage, network, and CPU isolations. And it's kind of giving you guarantees that multiple processes can run at the same time and that no single process can, can take over the entire machine. And probably most people in this room probably run Windows or Linux, and they're very happy. But what happens when you have processes and you have hundreds, you want to run hundreds of them? You know, uh, for example, I work on a time series database and I need 100 servers to run one of my microservices. Well, the Linux scheduler can't schedule processes across multiple machines, right? So, okay, what do you do? You go and you use Ansible or you use Chef and then you go spin up 100 servers and then you try to throw your executable on 100 servers. But how do you manage the load between them? And that's where kind of distributed schedulers kind of end. So you can kind of conceptually think of them kind of like how the Linux scheduler does, except they take your entire data center. So for example, you'll, you could take a couple hundred Linux servers, right? 
and you can throw them in a distributed scheduler. And the distributed scheduler will look at how much disk storage each node has, how much CPU left each has, and how much memory. And it creates quotas. So applications can kind of come to the distributed scheduler and say, I need eight CPUs, I need 16 gigs of RAM, and I need 32 instances. And the distributed scheduler will ask each one of the servers in your cluster, OK, how much resources do you have left? And it will move your application onto nodes that have resources. And if a node dies, if you have a server die, it will move those, ser it will move those processes to another server. So you, you, you kind of have like the very like 30 second overview of like what is a distributed scheduler. And you say, why do I need this? Because I already have my DevOps plan right now. I deploy my applications on the servers. If a server dies, I just get another virtual machine from my cloud provider and everything is fine. And I think the real challenge and the real change that's kind of happened in the last year or two is kind of this evolution of microservices. Um, he, who here is doing a microservice architecture? Anybody? OK, like half the room. So for the other half of the room that's not, you'll probably see this soon as your startup grows. So basically, what microservices are are saying that as we scale our organizations, as we go from a five-company startup to like a 500-person startup, we're going to have growing pains. And we're no longer going to have giant monolith applications, and we're going to start breaking out our applications into small, small services. And those services are probably going to be stuck into Docker containers, right? And now if you have 100 different services that need to be deployed independently, well, you don't want to have 1,000 machines. You don't want to spin up a virtual machine for every single web service that you have, right? It just becomes untenable from like a time of network uh, network admin time, right? Also from deployment. Um, who here is actually like, like DevOps for, instead of just a developer? Just, we have a few. How about who people are pure developers in the room? Just a few. Okay, all right. So like, there's like this handoff a lot of times between development teams and ops teams of how do you do deployments? And containers kind of make deployments so much easier. So to kind of color this talk, I, I work on a distributed time series written in Go. It's called Vulkan, and it's totally open source, and you can download it now. And basically, what we're building is we build a time series database that collects metrics across a million virtual machines. So we have a very high, we have a high throughput system that's like storing 20 terabytes of storage. We have three gigabits of network traffic of metrics coming in. And we have very low read and write latencies. And we want to take this application. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about how we took this application and how we actually deployed it onto first Mesos and then Kubernetes. So you don't have to memorize this, but just so you can have a kind of a picture of like what our application looks like. So our application is kind of typical in the, the new microservice architecture. We have some authentication microservices. We have microservices that actually ingest metrics from users. We have three different databases. We have uh, Kafka, which is a queue. We have MySQL, and we have Cassandra. So we have a lot of different pieces of state and microservices that are both interacting with users on the front end. So like we have some microservices that expose APIs to JavaScript, and we have some that are only exposed to other machines, right? So it's kind of very typical microservice architecture. So first thing, we, we got a whole bunch of new sysadmins come into the company, and they said Mesos is the best thing ever. So we bought like 10 racks of servers, with like a 1,000 machines, and we set up this amazing Mesos cluster. And I looked at it, and I said, oh my god, this is awesome. I never, ne I need, never need to do DevOps again, because I'm just going to put it onto this magical Mesos thing, and everything's going to be wonderful, right? So was it? Well, not exactly. <laughs> so what's really cool is Mesos has all these really nice dashboards. So at first, you're kind of lured into this sense of like false security. 
you go and it takes about 10 minutes to deploy your application the first time onto Mesos. You literally write one JSON file and you can deploy your containers onto Mesos. So in 10 minutes, we spin up 100 nodes of our server and it's all running on Mesos and we're like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. Like a node goes down, it scales up more, we wanna scale up five more, we wanna scale it down, we want memory, it's great. And then it has all these dashboards and the dashboards say, oh, you're using six CPUs, you're using 36 CPUs across 12 machines. And you're like, oh, this is absolutely amazing. Um, and what's kind of cool is you also have this great efficiency. So for example, our data team was running a Hadoop cluster. And if you know about Hadoop, Hadoop is really IO intensive. And our microservices were very CPU intensive. So we were able to cram more things onto different machines. So basically, you can say Hadoop needs 90% of the I.O. on the machine, but our microservices need 50% of the CPU. And Mesos will actually schedule the Hadoop clusters to run with the microservices and share resources. So you get very good utilization of all of your machines without having to use like virtual machines and slice things up very inefficiently. And what's cool is this is kind of another picture of an example of like how Mesos like distributes things. So like if you have three different services, you want these services to run on different servers. Well, at a certain point, well, what if a whole bunch of servers go down at once, right? You don't want your application to go down. Well, you can say I need it to be in at least three racks in the data center. So Mesos will make sure, Mesos knows about physical racks in your data center, and it will make sure, okay, it's between this many racks. Well, then you get a little bit larger like us, and you say, well, I need this in at least two data centers, or at least three data centers. And it will actually spread your application out across multiple racks in multiple data centers. And if a rack goes down or an entire data center goes down, it can move the load onto another data center. And it does this kind of transparently without, you just configure it, and it will, in theory, in theory, it will just move it on. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about why that isn't always the case. Um, so when we first started using Mesos, we deployed onto this thing called Marathon. And Marathon is this really nice GUI for container-based applications. So Marathon makes it really simple. You write a single JSON file, and you can deploy any container-based application in a minute. Like, I mean, you can write the entire JSON file in a minute, and you deploy it in about 10 seconds. And it will manage however many instances. You want 100 instances, you want 30 instances, you can scale it up and down. So we started to use Marathon, and we wanted to start moving other things onto Marathon. So we said, great, our microservices are running on Marathon. And we wanted to move Kafka uh, onto Marathon, too. Uh, but here's where it gets strange. So Mesos is a scheduler. It schedules resources. Then Marathon is another scheduler that schedules containers on top of the Mesos scheduler. Now, if you want to run other things, other things have schedulers that run on top of the Marathon scheduler, which runs on top of the Mesos scheduler. So as you can see, the complexity starts to really stack up with, with Mesos. Um, so first thing we tried to do was deploy our Kafka cluster onto Mesos. And we were running maybe like a five terabyte cluster of Kafka, which is fairly large, maybe about 15 nodes or something like this, and was awesome. So there's a custom scheduler for Kafka on Mesos. So you throw, you throw the custom scheduler on, and there's literally a command line utility, and you say, how much RAM does the cluster have? Okay, it needs a terabyte of RAM. It needs 15 terabytes of disk, and it needs at least 15 servers. And you do that, and you have a clustered out Kafka instance that's using 15 terabytes of storage. And you did this in like two minutes. And we said, this is amazing. This is the future of computing. Like, we were like so sold on this thing. We were like, this is awesome. So we started to use this, and we didn't know about some of the other side effects of Mesos. So one of the things Mesos does is in things like network partitions. We know as all ops, SRA type people, network partitions happen. But Mesos has really bad behavior in network partitions. 
if, so for example, our New York data center had a network partition inside of itself for quite a long period of time. And Mesos said, you know what, I'm just gonna kill everything. Because I can't, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's running or not, so I'm just gonna kill it. So what's great about Kafka, if you know Kafka, if you kill a single Kafka node, nothing happens. You kill two Kafka nodes, nothing happens. You kill three, nothing happens. You kill 90% of your Kafka nodes, well, you just lost all your data. Um, so Kafka couldn't, obviously couldn't survive like the majority of the nodes going offline all at the same time. So we said, okay, this, we can't do this. We can't run, obviously we can't run Kafka on top of Mesos. Um, what, we, what we tried next was we actually tried running Cassandra on Mesos. And Cassandra is a bit different, right? So Cassandra, you, it doesn't have a custom scheduler, but what happens is because schedule, Cassandra is so resource intensive, you end up needing to dedicate nodes in your cluster to Cassandra. So for example, 10 of the Mesos servers were only Cassandra, and they could only run Cassandra. And we had to manually pin certain servers to run as Cassandra. So that way, they would also never lose their disk in a network partition, and they would keep running. But if you have to manually set up which servers run Cassandra, how is running that on Mesos any better? Because it's not scheduling the resources. If a server goes down, it's not automatically moving it. So we ended up finding out that running Cassandra on Mesos was pretty much kind of a non, was a non-win for us. So like, we, we didn't really want to do it. And um, I know at this point, I've been hating on Mesos a lot. And that's because I have a lot of internal pain from all the time we spent with Mesos. But a different team in our company had a really good success story. And I'm gonna leave that for later and I'll, I'm gonna come back to that. Because I don't wanna only say negative things about Mesos because I know I'm gonna get attacked in the hallway because I saw a lot of Mesos stickers on people's laptops in here. Um, so after the whole Mesos thing, I was like, look, I want a scheduler that can work in any condition. That if a data center goes down, it's okay. If a rat goes down, it's okay. It doesn't care. Like, it just kind of like works independently. And I found one, and it was amazing. It's called Nomad. And Nomad uses gossip. So each and every single server in the data center will gossip between each other. And data centers gossip between each other. So if, a, if two data centers go down, it's okay. <laughs> the two data centers will continue to work independently without a master and be able to continue running applications. So it's really great. Like if you want to run like microservice applications, the only downside of Nomad is I couldn't find a single person that uses this in production. So that was kind of a non-starter for us. Um, it is a really cool architecture and it's made by the HashiCorp guys. Um, I kind of hope that they do something with this, but it's still kind of very nation. Um, so after we got burnt on all this, we actually moved our application back to virtual machines. And we said, look, this stuff is just not ready. We said, distributed schedulers are not ready. This is just not it. And then, of course, a new wave of people in the company came in and they said, no, 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 no. This Kubernetes thing. This, this Kubernetes thing is what you need to do. This is the real, this is the real stuff. And we were really skeptical because they had fancy dashboards again and like really nice UIs and we're like, uh-uh, I'm not gonna get tricked twice. I'm not gonna even use the UI this time so that way I'm not happy with it. Um, so we like slowly dipped our feet into using Kubernetes. Um, and, what's, and what we did was we just moved stateless portions of our architecture onto Kubernetes. So we just moved microservices onto Kubernetes. And it actually worked really well. Kubernetes, we've been running now, we've been running now on Kubernetes for a year and a half. And now almost half of the applications inside the company that are stateless run on side of Kubernetes. And, and we've been really successful. And I think the reason we've been really successful is Kubernetes doesn't try to do as much as Mesos. It really tries to punt on stateful applications. It tries to really just focus strongly on, okay, we have stateless microservices. You'll run your databases externally, 
And maybe in the future, we'll start to support that on Kubernetes. But for now, we're just going to focus on having like a very rock solid, very simple core. And Kubernetes was so much more easy to understand, to install. You can run a mini version of it on your laptop called Minikube. And it's container aware. So like, it's just containers by default. So like, you build a YAML file, and you deploy the YAML file onto Kubernetes, and that's it. And it's pretty simple. Um, so, but the, we, we kind of ran into a couple annoying things. So, who here runs Kubernetes, by the way? Does anybody here run Kubernetes? Okay, only like five people. That's cool. Uh, you also, if you guys use Google Container Engine, you're also running Kubernetes, by the way. So, that's, so there's probably a lot of people that run it that don't know. But what's kind of cool about Kubernetes is it also has, it, it can isolate your applications. So like, for example, we have special network proxies into the Kubernetes cluster. And the Kubernetes cluster, um, microservices within the Kubernetes cluster can talk to each other. And then people coming inbound to the Kubernetes cluster come through like a custom proxy. Um, the, the, if you guys try out Kubernetes, probably the most frustrating thing at first is the YAML file. They have this very complex YAML file that has lots of duplicates and lots of comp complexity. So what's really hilarious, or maybe not so hilarious, is I've bumped into at least three or four other companies that have written their own small language that generates the YAML file. So internally at DigitalOcean, we have a JSON file that we use that generates the YAML format because it ended up being a lot simpler. And the dev developers really went for it. Like, it really made things easier. And I've met three or four other people that have done the same. I kind of hope that one of these projects actually becomes more standard, because um, that's kind of really one of the biggest hurdles. The other thing we did was we made everybody do command line based deployments. So like in the past with like mesos and stuff, you can go into the GUI and do uploads. But for like a really Linux dev team, we really wanted to just do command lines. And we actually even made our own little command lines that make it really easy to do deployments. And one of the, one of the key things that I really want to recommend as you move to these kind of container-based solutions, what's going to happen is you're going to start doing deployments two or three times a day. And different people on your team are going to do deployments. And you're going to get into situations where you might accidentally overwrite other people's changes by accident without realizing it. And one of the ways we got around it is there's a utility called kubediff. And as you do the deployment, it will actually tell you if somebody else changed like an environment variable or configuration setting inside of, your, inside of the YAML file. So that way you can actually tell, oh wait, somebody actually changed this config. I didn't know that they changed the config. I should probably double check with them. And it makes it so like different people can be doing deployments. Even on a four person team, we found that sometimes there was like locks and like confusion about who was doing deployments at what time. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what our final architecture looked like. And then I want to talk about some of the best practices we use for, for microservices. So our final architecture kind of looked like this. So the yellow boxes are what actually got deployed onto Kubernetes. And as you see, like almost all of our microservices got deployed onto Kubernetes. We have front end web services that actually go to browsers. We have internal services that read from Kafka, that write to Cassandra. And we have an authentication web service. The only microservice that we couldn't run on Kubernetes yet was our inbound metric uh, microservice. And the reason we couldn't run this one yet is because we have three gigabits of metric traffic a second. And we have multiple dedicated load balancers, physical machines that are load balancers for just these metrics because there's so much data. And the problem right now with Kubernetes is you have to run virtual machines. Well, or at least in our setup, we're running virtual machines for our load balancers inside of Kubernetes. And we could not get the high enough throughput for multiple gigabits. But for most of our applications, like even our APIs to customers, we don't have that much throughput, and we can run all that on Kubernetes. So we only had one use case where it couldn't. And 
there's, there's probably other ways to mitigate that, and I think that there's a lot of roadmap that's happening on Kubernetes to fix things like that. Um, right, so I wanna talk, I wanna step back, because now we've kind of talked about what is a distributed scheduler. You know, why, why are some of the good reasons why you would wanna use it? And hopefully some of the use cases you shouldn't. You shouldn't run right now, you should not run a database on a distributed scheduler. Just none of them are mature enough to really run a kind of a stateful database that you actually care about uh, on them. Uh, that's just my opinion. You come to me afterwards if you feel differently, but I, I would love to hear differently. Um, so I'm gonna talk now, I'm gonna switch gears a bit and talk a little bit about some of the best practices we use while running on distributed schedulers. So there's obviously been a lot of talks today and yesterday about metrics. And um, I'm a big fan of Prometheus. Anybody here a Prometheus user? All right, we got like 10 people in the audience. There's one guy that looks really excited, like he really likes it. Um, I'm a bit biased because I commit to Prometheus and I'm a user, so. But you know, this, this, all this, what I'm talking about is all gonna apply if you use InfluxDB or if you use Graphite. But basically, what we do is, inside of Kubernetes, we run an instance of Prometheus. And Prometheus gets the metrics from every single microservice that runs inside of a Kubernetes cluster. Did you have a question? Okay, I'll let you have the question later. Um, so as we run different Kubernetes clusters in different regions, so we, for each, data center we have, we have one to three Kubernetes clusters because we're quite a large organization. But we run a different metrics instance in every single Kubernetes cluster and we store the metrics in that, just in that one place. And what we do is instead of trying to aggregate all the metrics into one place, we just use Grafana as the front end that knows about all the, all the Prometheuses in different regions. The other thing I wanna note is if you, have, if you still have a lot of legacy services that are not running on Kubernetes, we found that it was best to run separate instances of the metrics pooling for the legacy services and not kind of combine them with Kubernetes because you, if you have your metrics externally, you can't introspect into all the individual instances of all the microservices inside of Kubernetes unless you're running inside of it. So you wanna kind of keep those separate and you can kind of just use Grafana as kind of a layer above it to like be able to find the metrics between the two. Uh, logging. So logging has kind of become really interesting in the last few years. I know some people, they don't even have metric systems anymore. They just write their metrics to their logs. And I wanna say something, hopefully this shouldn't be contagious now, is if you're writing your logs to a file, you're doing it wrong. Like, that's gone. There's, you should not be writing logs to files. Um, so kind of what I tell everybody now is that every application that you write should be writing to the syslog on the local system if you're on a Unix machine. And ideally, you have those syslogs be forwarding. If, if you're a big setup, you'll have those syslogs forward to local regional syslog aggregators. And then you can have those dump into Elasticsearch, or Graylog, or if you're using Logly, or one of these services. But if, you're, if you have to SSH onto a server to look at a log, you've failed, essentially. Um, so if we look at the diagram here, this is kind of our setup. So for each individual physical server that lives inside of the Kubernetes cluster, uh, all the microservices will log to the syslog on the, on the local physical server and it will forward into a regional aggregator. So like in New York, we have a regional aggregator. In Singapore here, we have a regional aggregator. And those regional aggregators will eventually forward to our giant Elasticsearch cluster in New York. So we have a 50 node Elasticsearch cluster with maybe a couple hundred terabytes of storage. And we just stick it all in there from all 10 of our data centers. We just dump it into one place. Because when you look at logs, you need to be able to look at it across your entire application space. So if, for example, if we have a customer complaining that he's having a problem, we need to be able to see all of his logs across all of his machines, right? Um, so I mentioned earlier that there was actually a Mesos success story. 
and I wanted to bring it up now, is our logging cluster. Our logging cluster runs entirely on Mesos. Uh, they have about 200 dedicated servers, I believe, that run Elasticsearch, syslog aggregators, all kind of things related to logging, and they run it all on top of Mesos. And it runs reasonably well. Now, they have a lot of issues where they have to pin specific Elasticsearch instances to specific physical machines to make sure that they don't ever lose data. But it's been running really well. Like, we run our entire company on top of this uh, Elasticsearch cluster for, it's been running over a year now on, on top of Mesos. So I won't totally hate on Mesos. It's definitely done a lot of really good things. Um, and it's the same. So, you know, if you're not using Kubernetes, you're not using Mesos, you're still just doing kind of traditional applications, I still say, even our Cassandra. So Cassandra, I think out of the box, wasn't doing syslog. So we just have something that reads the file and dumps it to syslog. Um, and that's what we've always done. We, the pattern is we never write or look at log files. We always just push it to syslog and then centralize the logs. That's kind of a general best practice that I see that's becoming more and more common across more organizations. Um, so those are kind of the, the core best practices. Um, just to like really recap quickly is one, mo do stateless applications on Kubernetes or Mesos. Um, do syslog aggregation and run different metrics instances for your Kubernetes cluster versus your traditional applications. And Really, the last upside to all this distributed scheduler is it really speeds up development and deployment. So every time we have a new application, so for example, we had a hack day last year, and we took two days and the whole company did hacks. Well, we deployed 50 new applications on the hack day without spitting up any more resources, because the hacks, they just ran on our dev Kubernetes cluster. And the developers were able very quickly to spit up very new applications without involving any ops or requesting any new hardware. So I think that's really going to be the win of distributed schedulers in the long term. Um, and choose your abstraction. So uh, I, I feel like Mesos is really awesome, but there's a lot of complications. So you keep adding all these abstractions for like schedulers for Kafka, or schedulers for Marathon, and schedulers for Mesos. At a certain point, you don't understand how your architecture works. And if a problem happens, you have no way to know how to debug it. So, you know, if you're going to take on all this extra stuff, you got to make sure that it's adding enough value. Because when stuff breaks at 3 in the morning, uh, you're not going to know how to fix it. 